Um, I realize at this point, like, we're about to be in the shit. We're going to get into a close range firefight from less than 20 meters away from the road. Um, I'm probably going to get killed. Some of these dudes are going to, like, who the hell knows what's going to happen? And I was scared. I was scared in that moment. Um, but then I just kind of pushed through it. I, I kind of had that, that, that epiphany, I guess you could say, it was like, fuck it. I'm going to take them with me. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I serve Warzone Tours as an Army Attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15-year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we hear the story of Jack Murphy, an Army Special Ops veteran who served as a sniper and team leader in 3rd Ranger Battalion and as a senior weapons sergeant in 5th Special Forces Group fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. Since leaving the military, he's broken stories on defense and special ops topics around the world as an investigative journalist, co-founded the website SoftRep, wrote four military fiction novels and a memoir, and now writes for Connecting Vets and hosts the podcast The Team House. He nearly died in uniform several times, has been smuggled across international borders, was detained by a foreign intel service, met Bashar al-Assad in Syria, and more. I hope you enjoy his combat story as much as I did. Jack, thanks for taking the time to sit down and share your story. Yeah, man, thanks for having me. So I, I, wanna, I wanna kick off with, uh, with you in your formative years as a kid. And one of the things in, uh, in your book, Murphy's Law, that really resonated with me was this description of, of being almost like an adult trapped in a kid's body. You couldn't wait to get out of high school, middle school, and just get on to life. I'd love to hear a little bit more about it, where you were, what your mindset was, and how the military came into play for you. Yeah, sure, man. I, uh, I, I grew up in a town called Sleepy Hollow, New York, a Hudson River Valley community, as they call it now, full of artists and bullshit and, and yuppies. It's, it's weird. But when I grew up, there was a, it was a post-industrial um, sort of town alongside the Hudson River. There's a General Motors plant there that closed down. Um, uh, how old was I? I don't know, around like 95 or 96. Anyway, uh, I grew up in that area. It was a suburbs outside New York City. Uh, and then my, uh, I went to high school in a place called North Salem, which is a little bit further up the line, northern Westchester County. Um, and yeah, I, I definitely, uh, I didn't really fit in with other kids in a sense. I, I always felt like I was, you know, an older person trapped inside a, a kid's body. Uh, I, I just hated school, hated high school, hated hated middle school, hated grade school, just miserable, honestly. Didn't like it at all. Um, and I, I read a lot. I read a lot of books, uh, you know, through this is a lot of this is pre-internet. The in, internet, it's very infantile state. Um, I think we probably got it around yeah, 97 or something like that. Um, so primarily you're looking at books and through reading books, you've kind of realized there's also this whole world out there. And I definitely did not want to spend my life being a townie. I didn't want to stay in the place that I was in. I did not want to um, live that life. So I kind of was shooting. I mean, I wanted to get the hell out of there. And, and, and honestly, to backtrack and look back on it, it's not like I was like a poor kid. We were like a middle-class family. It's not like I had bad parents. I didn't, you know, I had parents who cared about me. Um, so it, it wasn't like a bad situation. I was actually very fortunate, but there's a sort of angst inside of me as, as a human being. And even as a kid that I just wasn't satisfied with sort of this place I, I, or, or this role that I was kind of placed into. Um, so I was definitely wanting to get out of there and, and pursue a, a more adventurous life. And this, so before 9-11, uh, I was very interested in the military. And I figured that the best way to go about this would probably be to join the French Foreign Legion. And so that was, that was kind of my game plan in the back of my mind was to join the Legion. I go overseas and probably I could see some action in Africa or something like that. Uh, then my senior year of high school, 9-11 happened. And so that completely changed the whole ball game. If you joined the U.S. military, I, was, I knew that I wasn't going to be, you know, sitting on a base picking up pine cones or, or you know, scrounging for ammo um, to fire in training because the training budget is so low. Like we're going in a, in a, into a very different world now. And you could just recognize that at that time, even as it was kicking off. Yeah, absolutely, man. And, and I mean... Go back to that time. I, I mean, it's almost kind of 
quaint. I hate to use that word to think about it, but after 9-11, like for Americans, we acted like it was World War III. Like it was the end of the world. And, and we were going to go to war with the entire world. I mean, we were talking about invading Somalia, Syria, Iran. Like we were just going to go everywhere at once, just blow up everyone, uh, even if it's just for shits and giggles. Um, so, I mean, it, it was apparent that the world had changed and the, the military's posture had changed. And after kind of um, trying to ignore or at least a, a lot, a big portion of our government not taking terrorism as seriously as it should have, that was all changing. And I, I think it was pretty easy to recognize that we were going to go after terrorism um, wherever it was and wherever the war took us. So what, what was it that got you hooked on the military, though? Because I, I think there were probably a lot of folks who are in middle school and high school and are like, I just can't wait to get out of this. But for you, there was like this hook for the military. And in the book, I think you talk about reading like everything you can about uh, vets and their experiences from beforehand, from Vietnam, the Gulf War, you're following that sort of thing. What was it that got you hooked on that family or just general interest? Not, not really family. Um, my, I, I have more of a, a fairly, I guess, typical New York uh, liberal family, Democrats. Uh, most of them are not in the military. Uh, my, my grandfather was drafted into the Navy, but he died before I was born. So I, I just had no knowledge really of any of that. Um, for for me, it, it came through, I mean, one of my earliest memories, and I, I think I, I talked about this in the book a little bit, was watching the Gulf War on television. Uh, and that sort of like night vision goggle, uh, tracer fire imagery that they would just play on CNN over and over and over again. And I just remember being like super excited by all of this. I thought it was, it was, I was enraptured by it. Um, and so I, I definitely tried to read about it and try to learn more about it as I, as I got older. And somewhere along the line, I don't necessarily even know how I learned about this whole thing, special operations. What is that? Um, started reading what books. And this, back in the 1990s, there's very little out there, very little literature to read about this stuff. Most of the books I ended up reading were about Rangers or SEALs or Green Berets in Vietnam. Um, there's, there's not much out there. The only contemporary book I found, I think when I was in high school is Black Hawk Down, just yeah. three, um, you know, Operation Gothic Serpent. I think that was the one book about, you know, modern Rangers that I could find. Um, and then there's, a, uh, that experience I wrote about in the, in the book when, uh, I was watching the movie Patriot Games when I was a kid watching it with my mom. And there's that whole scene where like the yeah. S goes and attacks this terrorist training camp in the middle of the night. And like the helicopters fly in, they drop off these SAS bros and they're going into the terror training camp and like waxing x-rays or whatever though, you know, probably with a knife in their teeth. And uh, I remember like looking at this and I, I'm trying to understand like, hold on, this isn't a war. This isn't like the World War II films. Like there's like going in all sneaky and like doing these guys up in the night. And I was like, I, I remember asking my mom, like, what are they doing? And she was like, oh, it's a secret mission. And I was like, secret mission? Like, you can do that? And she was like, <laughs> and I don't know how old, I was probably like eight or nine years old at this time. And I was like, fuck yeah, like, that's what I want to do. I want to be the guy in the black helicopter. Oh, shit, man. All right. So kind of coming out of high school, obviously 9-11 happens. <laughs> You're in New York. Um, what uh, kind of, how did you find your way to the army then? Did you just kind of go down to the recruiting center? Like what, what was your next step there to get in? Cause you really took the special ops path from, from reading the book. Like, it sounds like you knew what you wanted to get into. So how did you shape it that way? Cause I feel like not everybody's so lucky. Yeah, I, I was an easy mark for the United States military. Uh, I, I walked right into the recruiter's office and actually I wanted to be a Marine. I wanted to be a force recon guy. And I went into the Marine recruiter's office and I, and I knew you had to go be infantry, an infantry Marine first, which is cool. So I went into the Marine recruiter's office said, I want to be Marine infantry. And I, I, he didn't have to sell me. I was already sold, but he, he tried to hard sell me anyway. And like gave me this whole thing. Like, look, you got to sign up in the next 24 hours. You got to sign up right now. I can get you infantry right now. You come back next week. I can't get you infantry anymore. And like, he, he did this like used car salesman routine with me that I didn't need. I was, I was already going to sign up. I was already going to enlist. And it just like totally turned me off. And I, I was like, what, who is this guy? What is this all about? What's it like? It, it it feels like he's trying to scam me. It was, it was not a good feeling for a 17, 18 year old kid. Um, so I went down the hall to the army 
and you know, the rest is history. I, I, I signed up on a Ranger contract, uh, which is uh, option 40. How you, did you talk to your mom or your family about it beforehand? Or is it just like, you're going to do this? No, no human's going to stop you. No, well, I mean, they, they knew, uh, I mean, I don't think any, anyone was going to talk me out of it, but I mean, no, my, my, my folks definitely knew. Um, I told them about it. Um, and then, and then they came and saw me off. I mean, they were, they were very supportive of it. I mean, I think they understood that, like, I wasn't really college material at that point in my life. Um, and, and they, they, but I think they were also happy that like, I had like a drive and a goal and a focus and, you know, I wasn't like out there doing drugs and stuff like that or, or any of the, the, the bad things that, you know, young guys can potentially slip into. So I, I, I think they were probably as nervous as any parent would be in that situation, but also, you know, probably pretty happy that I was, you know, going to do, try to do something with myself. Yeah. At that time, just as you're signing up, had you ever shot any type of weapon before? Were you like in the outdoors? Cause you really get into this life that is embedded in, in that experience. So I'm just curious if you had been a shooter before or anything like that. Not really, no, very little. Um, I mean, I'd shot a gun before, a couple times before. Um, I was, yeah, no, I was not Daniel Boone. I was not some sort of outdoorsman. Uh, I learned land navigation in the military. I learned marksmanship in the military. Um, yeah, so, I mean, the military taught me all this cool stuff, and I was very yeah. good for them for that. Cool. So take me through going in at into the ranger lifestyle without having gone to ranger school yet because i from my experience on the officer side seeing guys come in in the infantry they'll go to ranger school then maybe eventually to the ranger battalion some of them won't go to the ranger bat what's it like when you're coming in as a 17 18 year old doing that uh, you know the the ranger regiment is big surprise it's very regimented um you know at that time it, we all had high and tight haircuts. You have to have a fresh haircut every Monday morning. Uh, you wear your spits and starches. So your, your boots, your jungle boots are spit shined, all, all shiny like a mirror. Uh, you know, your, your uniform is all starched and has sharp creases and everything on it. And, and it, it, there's a huge amount of focus even on your field gear. I mean, there are all these SOPs and how you, how you go about doing things. You have to take your name tape and sew it onto your, your Alice pack, your rucksack with dental floss because dental floss is stronger than thread. There are all these like, rangerisms and traditions and things that you have to do. Uh, and it was very interesting because I got to Ranger Battalion in 2003. Yeah, so I enlisted in 02, got to Ranger Battalion in 03. And it, it was like, um, so you remember the old web gear, the LCE, like uh, that you, you see in Vietnam War movies. I mean, that's what, you know, yeah. from then, um, there's a whole SOP with your LCE and how you have to tie down every pouch with 550 cord and burn the ends with a lighter and then stomp it out. And you have to have the right knots on every tie down. But it was, what was interesting was that after you did everything with your LCE, got it all ready to go and your team leader inspects it and approves of it and everything that would then go into your wall locker and you would never touch it again because now we had new kit that we were getting like uh um there's the rack and then there's this the molly vest it was like an assault more like an assault vest like something you would expect to find soldiers wearing today so it was like this transitional period where we we're leaving behind our our a part of our lineage as an elite airborne light infantry unit and going through this metamorphosis and turning into a modern counterterrorism unit. Um, and so that's kind of that moment I got there. But and as a young private, uh, you have not been to ranger school yet. You know, you went through there's a three week course, a three week selection course called RIP, which is basically a huge smoke session. It was yep. when I went. Um, and then you get to Ranger Battalion and you are you're not you're you're basically nothing. I mean, back, back in those days, your team leader owns you. I mean, they could they could. I don't want to say they could kill you. Maybe they could kill you, but they could bring you right up to the brink. And, and that, and that was perfectly acceptable. Um, so, so they're, they're, you're, you're being micromanaged. You're, you're being physically corrected uh, every day until you get it. And, uh, and, and that's kind of Ranger battalion life um, for a, a private when you first get there. Um, so it was a, it was an interesting formative experience. Yeah. And then how long until you got to ranger school from there? Not, not too, not too long. I, I was kind of fortunate that I, I went 
pretty quickly. And the only reason why, so the, the normal, normally they want you to spend like a year or two in Ranger Battalion to learn, to learn your job. Then you go to Ranger School, get your tab and come back and you'd be a team leader. Um, what happened in my case, I, I was, my first assignment, I was a uh, uh, Carl Gustav gunner. I was in the anti-tank section and I was only there like maybe three or four months. Uh, we did a, we did a train up over that summer that I got to participate in. And then what happened was our, uh, our battalion Sergeant major was getting mad that we weren't sending enough people to Ranger school. So he had all the privates in, in three, seven, five, do a PT test. And like, if you got a 300, like if you maxed out the PT test, you were going to ranger school. And so I did really well on the PT test and they're like, okay, you're, you're gone. See ya. And so off I was to ranger school and I had no idea what I was doing in ranger school. Absolutely no idea. Stumbled through it. It was, it, it was a horrible experience at the time going through it, especially like that as a, as a E2 knowing nothing. Um, but looking back on it, it was actually exactly the right experience um, that I needed to have as a young guy to learn all the basic infantry tactics and just drill it into my, my pea brain until I couldn't forget it. it so it, it was actually a very good experience for me. Yeah, you probably had, hadn't had time to learn any bad habits or be trained on something else. It sounds like you were pretty fresh going in. Yeah. And you just learned the like PhD level from the start, basically. Yeah. And it's like, if you tell me to do it, I'll do it. I, I mean, as a, as a E2, so you tell me this is how we're going to do an ambush. Okay. I'm going to do it. And if you tell me to do it 10 times, I'll do it 10 times. And if you want me to carry this heavy rucksack all day, I'll carry it all day. You know, I, yeah, I, I accepted that I was a private and I, I didn't, and it's a very competitive environment. A uh, Ranger battalion is, and, uh, and then Ranger school is a whole other little crucible that you have to go through. So I, I was I was all in. I was all about it. I was a little ranked battalion cult member, you know, loved every minute. <laughs> um, God, I have so many questions. But like, if you jump ahead, just real quick, you mentioned uh, later on in the war how how the army gets bogged down in this micromanagement of make sure everybody's gone and seen this training video and, and you're green on this. Did you experience that at that time or had tech? And just so you know, Jack, like I came into the military, like I did ROTC, but I started in 02, 03, much like you. So it was the old uniforms from an aviation perspective, like training the old war and now breaking into how we're going to do tactics. So I, I can appreciate that. And I remember what it was like. Are all your guys trained up on this sexual assault training? Was it like that in 03 in the Ranger Battalion? Or was it more like you could actually go train? There was there was some of it. It was coming in. Now the it, it was just at that moment where they were giving emails to every private in the, mm -hmm. in the like every every army private had a dot mil email, and it was like what was the name of that website? It was uh, God, I, this is like something that I just bleached out of my brain because it's so painful. Uh, but they, so they were they were trying to get every private, every soldier in the military onto these stupid websites, these stupid finance websites and everything else. But the, you know, there were only like a couple of computers at, in the company. Right. Maybe the PL or platoon sergeant had a computer and that was it. Um, so when it came time for certain things like that, like they would have the privates, you would have to like line up outside the platoon sergeant's door and one by one go in there. I, I remember even as a tab spec four sniper, uh, being made to like go in there, line up, and they're like, okay, Murphy, log into the website. And like, I try to, and like, I, I never used the damn thing, so I couldn't log into it. Murphy, why the fuck? <laughs> and it, it's like, what, what is this even about? What the hell is going on? Who cares about this website that no one, but the, um, so many of the things that we, we did um, that were administrative, they're still paper and pencil. Um, so your POV inspection sheet, your leave form was paper and pencil. And then we, we were in during that time, 03, 04, 05, going into that, um, it was more and more getting digitized. So I remember like a few years later in Ranger Battalion where um, filling out your leave form, it had to be done on the computer. And again, th not everyone had a computer. Uh, so and not everyone had an internet connection. So you would have to find like one private in the barracks who had a computer and we'd all like line up there. And because the websites were so awkward to use, it would take like two hours to fill out the leave form and submit it. It, it was just, yeah, it was a total mess. But I, I it, it was it was the early stages of all of that online training nonsense. It's bringing back bad memories for me, myself. So 
<laughs> when you get to, could you talk a little bit about sniper school with the Rangers? Um, you describe it. It's interesting in the book. I, I was surprised. I've not been around snipers. I, I've not talked to one. I'm very interested to hear about it. But you really describe how it, it sounds like the Marine sniper school seems to be like the pinnacle within the military. And you almost say like the Ranger school isn't quite to that level. What, what was it like going through sniper school as a Ranger? Well, I went through the uh, Army Sniper School. Um, some of my, like my squad leader, for instance, this guy, Joe, he had been through uh, Army Sniper School. He had been through the Marine Corps Scout Sniper Course, and he had been through the Special Forces Sniper Course. But, like, this guy was like God to me. He was awesome. And <laughs> he, he was an amazing shot. He, he won the International Sniper Competition a couple of years. Um, amazing, amazing shooter. Um, but... Your, your pal Jack, as uh, a tab spec four, I just went through the Army Sniper course, which is a, it was a five-week course that had been condensed down to three weeks um, because these guys were going overseas and doing MTTs in Iraq and stuff like that. So they took a five-week curriculum and squeezed it down into three weeks. So we were working from about, you know, five or six in the morning till nine o'clock at night every day for three weeks straight. I don't think we had a day off. Um it, it, and they trained you in all the basic sniper marksmanship, uh, doing uh, stalks, building your ghillie suit and doing stalks, um, target identification, um, all those sorts of things, doing a lot of known distance ranges, unknown distance ranges, shooting at snaps and movers. So some targets that will snap up in different places, you have to hit, hit them very quickly, or movers where the target is moving left to right, right to left, and you have to practice shooting a moving target. Um, so it, it was, it was a good course, I guess, but it, it was also like the basic training of snipers. It, it's where you go and learn all of your basic sniper, uh, marksmanship and, and, uh, field craft. And you, you mentioned in the book, like people probably have this image of the Vietnam sniper scout type relationship. And that it, it, it really wasn't like that, I guess, when you get into combat. So if we, if we advance into kind of your first combat experience, um, can you take us through like, where were you? What was it like? You probably had these images since you were a kid of reading about people in combat. And now here you are, like you're in a ranger unit in, in the theater. Where were you at and what was it like? Yeah. Uh, so my first deployment, I was a sniper in ranger battalion. Uh, had my, I've been in a ranger school, been a sniper school, did all that good stuff, all those things I was supposed to do. Um, Got deployed to Afghanistan with my my uh, squad leader that I mentioned. We were sniper partners, so Joe he had a he was carrying a 300 uh, 300 Win Mag uh, bolt action rifle that we had just gotten, and I was carrying an SR twenty five. Uh, it's a 762 semi automatic sniper rifle, and we deployed to Afghanistan. You know, ramp drops in uh, in Bagram Airfield. Um, we get off, we spend just um, maybe like 12 hours there. I think we loaded up a couple magazines with ammunition in case we got into contact or shot down or God knows what. I think we, we loaded up on like a basic load of ammo, picked up some, you know, uh, some pyro and stuff. Uh, loaded up onto a C-130 and flew down to Kaust. Uh, it was Fob Salerno down in Kaust province. Uh, get off there. Uh, it was uh, mostly Marines there, uh, some Marine infantry, it was like a Marine infantry battalion. And then there was a little compound within the compound where the Rangers were. Um, this was 2004. Um, so it was relatively quiet. There, there, uh, the war had been won, so to speak. We had, we had taken over Afghanistan. There were still some bad guys, some like Taliban and uh, Al-Qaeda dudes that we were trying to mop up and we were searching around for. But as far as like the insurgency and things like that, the the roadside IEDs, like that wasn't really quite a thing yet. Like that hadn't really come around. I mean, there were there was some some IED threat, but not not much. Um, it, so it was a very interesting period. But there was still work for us to do. Um, we we're chasing around bad guys. I mean, as far as the sniper role, um, being a direct action sniper, supporting direct action ranger operations. Yeah, it, it was. It's not so much about wearing a ghillie suit and going and crawling around in the bushes um, with a spotter, and you know, you, you look, tying your natural vegetation into your ghillie suit, with a floppy hat over there, and you're looking through a scope, and you know, uh, shooting some like uh, you know, uh, North Vietnamese Army sniper or uh, like NVA general or something like Carlos Hathcock. Um, that wasn't really 
what we were doing out there. One shot, one kill. You know, like like Tom Berenger taking the file to those little those, those bullets. You know, oh, they exactly. Get sometimes, you know, no, no, we weren't we weren't out there trying to win the Tom Berenger award or anything. Um, doing a uh, being a direct action sniper, being a ranger sniper, our job was for the most part to support uh, ranger platoons that are doing direct action raids. They're searching for high value targets. So the role that my squad leader and I would typically play is we would go in um, somehow, or sometimes we would just ride along with the, uh, with the line platoon. Um, sometimes we'd be riding with uh, the recce guys. But one way or the other, we would try to get overwatch to the target and then just overwatch it. And we could provide sniper support for the ground guys as they came in and made the breach and then started leapfrogging, building the building so that they would have sniper support. If somebody was trying to sneak up on them, if someone was getting up on the rooftops, you know, we would be there and we'd be able to take those guys out before they were able to ambush anybody. Um, and then once the objective was secured, we could turn around and pull outward security, or we could go on the objective, climb up on the roof and pull security that way and kind of have a, a, a security position and overwatch to see if there's any kind of like counterattack coming. Um, so that in a nutshell, that was our role. We also would go out sometimes with our, um, the recce team. Uh, it was a new reconnaissance team that had just been stood up. And so sometimes we'd support them as well. So what was your first mission where you were out there and maybe the first time you were out outside the wire doing that job and then if it was the same time or separately the first trigger pull you had and and kind of what's going through your mind I'm, I'm assuming you're what like are you like 20 years old at this time 21 21 holy crap all right yeah so what's the first time you're outside the wire what's going through your mind the first time was a, it, it was very much what I was just describing. It was a high value target. Uh, we we're targeting a high value individual. Um, rode out on the Humvees with, uh, with you know, Ranger Battalion. It was Charlie Company 375. Um, rode out with them. Uh, we did, went through the mission planning. So I kind of knew where I was going, what I was supposed to do. When the vehicles came to a halt, I jumped off the back of the vehicle and I kind of took a, a beeline right up a hill and got up to the top of a hill. Um, and then pulled the bipod legs down on my SR-25, got down behind the gun. And, and that, from that vantage point, I was able to overwatch the, uh, the, the assault teams, the Ranger squads that were coming in and clearing that objective. And so it was a good position. I was able to kind of like scan ahead of them, make sure that there's nobody trying to creep up on them. Um, and then once they secured the objective, you know, pulled the 180 and pulled outward security. Um, so it was a good mission. It was uneventful. Nothing happened. That, that was my first experience in, in quote unquote combat um, and starting to see how Rangers conduct operations. And, you know, they're, they're second to none. They're very good at what they do. And I, and I was fortunate to work with them. What, what uh, was this like everything you had imagined it would be when you were setting up? I mean, your first time rolling outside the gate and doing this. Yeah, I mean, it, it was super cool. Um, it was everything I, I, I wanted it to be, um, you know, it, through my kind of young, naive mind. Um, and also just being in a place like Afghanistan, it's like, bro, you're, you're not in Kansas anymore. Um, you're seeing it, it looks like something out of like a, a Conan the Barbarian novel or something like this. These like kind of windswept crags. Uh, these, these huge mountains and up at the top, you can see that they're capped in snow or these flat, like Kaust is, a, they call it the Kaust Bowl. It's like a, a sort of flat desert that just kind of goes on and on forever. It's like you're on the surface of the moon until those, the aforementioned uh, mountains just sort of ringing all the way around. Um, it's, uh, it's just, it was just fascinating and exciting. And every place we went and everything we did was a new experience for me. And, and I was just, it's super excited by all of it. I mean, it was, it was exactly like, like you said, I mean, something that I'd been wanting to do since I was a kid and now here I was living it. Yeah. And just so Jack, I was in Salerno in 08. Uh, that's where we were based out of covering like seven provinces. Uh, so we would, as Apaches, we could get outside the bowl and then Kiowas would kind of handle what, what was going on inside the bowl because of the altitude. So I definitely like the bowl, the way it looked, the, uh, even the climate was pretty cool in that area. So very neat. Yeah. That, that, uh, yeah. You're talking about the airfield where you guys would have been. And then there is uh, over on one side, there's a graveyard. I uh, presumably that was still there in, in 08. And then over on the other side, there's a mountain where that was where the range was and the burn pit and all that. Yep. yep. 
Were, were you there when the fob got attacked? So, yeah, so that fob, um, are you talking, I, I was there when the fob got attacked, but I feel like it's been attacked a lot and it, it just depends. You're not talking about Chapman, right? You're talking about Salerno? And I'm talking about Salerno where, uh, where the, the enemy got on there and blew up some helicopters or something. Um, so I was there in 08, I was on, on call when we got hit with like a VBIED and guys were hitting the wire and we were running out to the aircraft with like bullets coming in as we were getting in and taking off and, uh, do everyone wanted to get in on this. Cause there were a lot of guys who were pulling security of that base for a year, like artillery. It was an artillery unit that I think was headquartered there. And they're like wanting to get in on the action. Cause they're not rolling outside the wire doing stuff. It was chaos, man, for hours. And I nearly shot down my wingman. Like we were all in this this crazy fight uh, at night at Salerno. It was unreal. That's awesome. Yeah, it was fun. Um, hey, take me if you can. The first time you pulled the trigger, where I, I think you were still in Afghanistan, right? It's the same deployment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same deployment. Uh, this was the winter of 04, 05. I don't think we had been through Christmas yet. So it was, it was probably like December or something, but um, the, so this was a operation to go do some reconnaissance down the Pakistan border. And so it was me, the recce team, a six man recce team. And we took a couple of 11 Charlie's couple mortar guys with us. Um, they brought their uh, 81 millimeter mortar system. So, we went down there, and so just to kind of paint the picture, um, we were we all had beards, we had long hair. We um, for this operation, we were um, disguised as Afghani paramilitary soldiers. So the uh, the the guys at Bob Chapman, the OGA guys, um, had supplied these uniforms, tiger stripe uniforms for us. I think they they gave us one of their interpreters also, and uh, so we were disguised as Afghani troops. And we were driving in Hiluxes and, and, and low visibility vehicles, um, drove out to this place. I mean, through these like incredibly narrow valley passes that had probably been dynamited open just like, you know, within 50 to 75 years, I would imagine. I mean, they were just wide enough to get a Hilux through. Um, and just driving through some of these valleys, I mean, you'd see the, uh, the steps, those platforms where they grow the crops that are built just into, into the side of the valley with these like complicated irrigation systems. And, um, I mean, just the things you see in those valleys, it's like, you're, it's like, you're on a, on another planet. It's literally like you're going back in time. Um, you're, in, you're in a totally different world. Um, we drove out there and we got to a border control point, uh, where we were going to base out of. And so these were, you know, dudes that the, that the CIA had trained up and they were running the border control point on the Pakistan border. Um, and the specific reason why we were out there was the recce team was going out to recon an objective that Charlie Company 375 was looking to hit. Uh, the objective was supposedly, and I, I, to this day, I don't know if it's true or not, but it, we were going after the guy who had planned the Pat Tillman ambush. So Pat Tillman, of course, was an NFL player who joined uh, the 75th Ranger Regiment. Um, I was in 3rd Ranger Battalion. He was in 2nd Ranger Battalion. Um, and his platoon got ambushed. They, uh, uh, Pat's team got off and started bounding on the enemy. And a lot of confusion took place. And Pat Tillman ended up getting killed in a friendly fire incident. And actually, I have the book right here. This is a war story by Stephen Elliott. Um, Stephen's a really nice guy. He's a really good dude. He was, he believes he was the ranger who shot and killed Pat Tillman in the confusion that night. Um, so I was on that, on this operation. Um, I was doing the sniper support for them. Um, you know, so what happened, I mean, to walk you through what happened that day, um, we got into the high uh, the, the vehicle I was in, it was just me and a couple of Afghans, a couple of Afghan paramilitary guys. And we were just in there kind of shooting the shit, talking a little bit. It was a, a bright, sunny day. Um, we were driving around up in the mountains. It looked like maybe, um, like Colorado, um, to try to like paint the picture a little bit, a lot of like short pine trees, um, in a very mountainous area. And again, you know, 
here I was wearing my Pakol cap and my beard and carrying my sniper rifle. And like, I was exactly where I wanted to be doing exactly what I wanted to do. It, it was awesome. Um, maybe, maybe too awesome. I didn't, I didn't fully understand the, the, the gravity. And, and I was also, I mean, in fairness to myself, I was also being given a lot of responsibility that perhaps a little bit more than I was ready for as a, as a 21 year old ranger on my first deployment. Um, but it is what it is. I mean, that, and that's, uh, that's something I also love about Ranger Battalion, though, is that they give you a lot of responsibility as a young man, and you, and you have to man up to it. Um, but what happened that day was we drove out in, the, uh, in these vehicles. We got to the mission support site. A mission support site is just like you're going to set up a little patrol base there, pull security, and um, get, get the radios up. And you know, then the, the other element is going to go out and do their mission. So you're, you're just supporting the mission and that's all that's really going on there um so the recce team the six-man recce team uh is getting ready to leave and they're going to go out on foot and they're going to do a recon on this um compound that's supposedly the guy who planned the pat tillman ambush is there we we have a face-to-face -face. um he gives me you know kind of a five point like hey here's where we're going here's what we're doing um, take these actions, if you make contact, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and he gave me the additional task. He said, hey, while we're gone, look around this area, see if you can find some, um, some HLZs. So like um, what he meant by that is some hasty landing zones or some places where we could land helicopters because that's part of their recon mission is where can we land the birds for the assault team. So the recce team departs, um, me and another ranger and like two Afghans we go near, we're driving around nearby, um, looking for some landing zones. We find a few potential places. Um, I mean, again, it, it's kind of a little stupid on my part. Um, but I mean, thinking back to it, I mean, I was kind of running around between these pine trees, you know, off like by myself in Afghanistan, <laughs> like what the hell was I doing? Um, we get, we get a, a call. So the other ranger with me had an embitter. It's like a, it, it, it's a, it's a small radio for inter-team communication. It's not a long range radio. Um, so he had comms with the mission support site and he was getting staticky kind of chatter from them saying something about bad guys coming towards our position, um, towards the MSS. So we're like, oh shit. Okay. So we get in the truck, we drive back to the MSS, link up with those guys. And now we get, um, we talk to uh, the other ranger there who's on the radio and he reports that the recce team had radioed back to them that they had eyes on a 10 man element, uh, 10 Taliban looking dudes carrying weapon systems or carrying Kalashnikovs. One of them looks like he's carrying a recoilless rifle or something like that. And they are walking towards our mission support site. So again, to paint the picture at the mission support site, it is myself, one recce guy uh, who is with me. And then the second recce guy who's on the radio. So that's it, three Americans. And then maybe there was um, maybe there was like a dozen Afghans, something like that. And and we don't speak their language. We don't, I mean, so it, it's, it's an interesting situation. And from our mindset, it's sort of like, okay, do we just sit here like sitting ducks and just wait for the enemy to run into us and, and attack us? Or do we be proactive and, and get the drop on them? So what I decided was we'd go down the road a little bit and we'd set up a hasty ambush and we'd ambush these guys as they came in to assault us, to attack our, our MSS. So that's what we did. We got in the, a couple of vehicles. We drove down the road, um, kind of cached the vehicles off to the side in the brush, walked further down, handrail on the road. And so we're on like a downward slope looking down at the road um, and somewhat you know, just like ranger school, but with indigenous soldiers in this case, who I don't speak their language, I'm setting them down individually behind trees. Like you're here, they kept wanting to get up on their knees or, or stand up, or they want to do the, the squat, um, you know, with a AK at their hip. And I'm like, again, trying to try do the ranger school thing. Like, no, get down in the prone behind the tree, hold the gun in front of you, look down the sights, all that kind of stuff. Um, get them all down in position. Some of them are listening to me. Some of them aren't. I get my bipod legs down. I get behind my SR. Um, so all the Afghans are to my left. The one other American who's with me is on my right. And he has the radio getting really static, intermittent comms. We, we did not have good communications at all. Um, I realized at this point, like, we're about to be in the shit. 
we're going to get into a close range firefight from less than 20 meters away from the road. Um, I'm probably going to get killed. Some of these dudes are going to, like, who the hell knows what's going to happen. And I was scared. I was scared in that moment. Um, but then I just kind of pushed through it. I, I kind of had that, that, that epiphany, I guess you could say, it was like, fuck it. I'm going to take them with me. Like, we're going to do this. And Jack, real quick. So th- actually, I wanted to ask you about that because the more I've talked to folks and I've definitely had a feeling like this before. And in the book, you say, I think this is the same part. It, the, the other American you're with is Val. Is that right? Yeah. At this yeah. point. And you say, I was going to die this day. I understood that. I resigned myself to my fate. Um, is that kind of like the first time you had felt that and, and you just came to grips with this is how you're going to, how it could yeah. go? For sure, man. Um, because I'd never been in like a life or death situation like that. I'd been on a couple of operations. I would not, I would not define any of them as being about life or death. Um, no, but nobody, no bad guys died. No good guys died. There were no casualties on those operations. So I had not, I had yet to be in that, that situation. Um, now I was in that situation. It yeah. was, it was inescapable at this point. Like I had committed, um, there, there was no turning back from that. Uh, and it was real. I mean, this isn't a book. This isn't a movie. This is some real shit. Like you're, you're maybe you're probably not going to make it. I mean, a hasty near ambush is incredibly dangerous. Um, but so, so something, something changed in my mind that day, uh, or something broke in my mind, depending on how you want to define it. But I don't think I was ever quite the same person after that. Um, uh, do you want to, do you want to continue through the, uh, I, I want to continue through the trigger pull, but I, I, I don't want to miss what you just said. Like, cause I think there are a lot of guys and gals who have probably had a moment like that and it truly changes you. I'd love to hear more. Like, what did it change in your mind? It, it changed my sense of risk and my sense of danger. Uh, that, that nothing, I, that my entire life and the way I perceived reality, I think was different after that. And I think it, it also leads into um, a mindset that you have to have as a soldier um, and something that is absolutely critical to have um, when, I mean, if you didn't have that, if you didn't have uh, the, the sort of uh, there's an element of don't give a fuck. There's also an element of arrogance to it that, that you think, you know, you can do this, that this, this is in your wheelhouse. You can accomplish this. You can accomplish mission impossible. You, you have to have a little bit of that, that attitude um, to do that, but it also leads to some unhealthy behaviors right? Some like yeah. risk taking. Um, you can look at the things, look at the things that I was doing in between deployments. Like when I went to the Q course, when I look back at it, I, when I, I was, we'll, we'll probably get to it later, but after I was in between two deployment, th- in between deployments, I went to the Q course, the special forces qualification course, like a, a year and a half of training. And when I look back on it, I realized like my mind was like breaking while I was there because yeah. I didn't have that like constant adrenaline high. Like I was going to language school, like trying to learn Arabic and things like this. Like I was not there. My mind was not there. My mind was in Iraq. My mind was in Afghanistan. Um, so all the this, uh, you know, drinking and excessive uh, risk-taking behavior, I, I, it all plays into that. I mean, the things that make you very successful in combat make you a, a complete train wreck back home. Yeah. <laughs> if you look at... If you look at, you know, the things I did after the military and some of the very risky things I did um, in Syria and in Iraq, um, I I would say that some of that risk taking behavior uh, that I engaged in as a journalist is also related to my inability to adapt back to civilian life, that I was still facing that constant adrenaline spike, that constant high. And we can get into that a little bit more, but I, I think that's what it changed for me. And not to get too philosophical, but that change that you described, like I've definitely heard people talk about it. Do you think that that's something that you can lose at some point? Or is that just kind of with you, the mindset shift for the rest of your life? I mean, I think it's something that you can get over and I've tried hard to, um, but I do think it's something that's always in the back of your mind. There's always that little guy in the back of your mind that's like, yeah, I could charge a a Nazi pillbox and and climb through the and throw it in there and, and clean out a dozen Nazis like an Indiana Jones movie. Like uh, it, there's, there's always that person in the back yeah. of your mind. And probably when I'm like an 80 year old man wearing diapers, I'm still gonna be like, oh, I'm the same man I always was. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you about al Qaeda. I'll tell you about al Qaeda. You don't know anything, damn kids. You know, <laughs> I, I think that's always gonna be with you. Um, 
And I, I think also that that person becomes such a strong part of your identity. It's just really difficult to give up. It becomes like a religion. It's like, it, yeah. If I change, then who am I? I and, and then that's the whole other part of transitioning out of the military or transitioning out of that lifestyle. Like if I give this person up, then what's left? Like, who am I after that? And mm -hmm. I, I remember I was thinking about going back to Syria and doing that whole thing over again, getting smuggled in and everything for a second time. And I remember waking up one morning and just kind of I, this feeling washed over me. I, I, it's hard to describe where I realized I don't have anything to prove to anyone, especially myself. Like, I, I've been a tough guy. I've been a tough dude. I've been through tough things. Um, I've been, I've been the dumb guy. I've been the smart guy. I, I've been, I've been strong. I've been weak. I, I, I've done, I, you know, I've been through that whole journey and I, it's, it's hard to describe why. I mean, maybe I was having dreams that night or something. I really don't know, but I, I can remember a specific morning waking up and realizing like my ego no longer required me to go and do these things anymore. And, um, and that was, a, 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 I think that was the moment I finally was deprogrammed out of the military. <laughs> It took like in the military for eight years. It probably took me eight years to come out of it. I, I believe it. God. All right. So t take me back. You're, you're in a near ambush. It's you, an American, and a couple Afghans. You know you're committed. You're on. You have your SR-25. Is that right? Yeah. All right. So now get, take me back to it. So yeah. So I got around in the chamber, popped the scope caps, looking down the sights, and um. So again, I'm on a downward slope looking down at the road, at, the, at this dirt road. Then on the other side of the road, it slopes up again. So if the enemy came down the road, it would be, it's actually a perfect ambush in a lot of ways. Because the, if the enemy tried to run out of the, my kill zone, they would have to run uphill. So it'd be a slaughter. Um, however, what actually happens is I hear someone across the road, up that slope on the opposing side, I start hearing rocks shuffle and little rocks come rolling down the hill. And then I realize, oh shit, they're not on the road. They're, they're um, handrail on the road also, and they're kind of coming down diagonally. So because of the, these big pine trees, and I'm down behind a pine tree using its cover, I can't even see them at this point. They're kind of obscured by all those pine needles, but I, I can kind of like hear them and I can see these rocks come shifting down the, that, down the hill. They actually walk right through the kill zone I had set up. Um, so by the time they're they're walking diagonally and they're getting towards where the road is, they're they're outside the the kill zone I had planned. So I pick up the rifle and I shift it so that I'm looking at an angle where I'm able to see them as they're kind of coming down uh, through these pine trees alongside the road. And what I'm seeing is silhouettes. I'm not able to, through my scope even, I'm not even able to pick out a whole lot of detail. They're like, it, it, they, a silhouette, you know, they look like a shadow um, moving through the tree line. The first person in the order of movement moves inside my line of fire as I see him pass through my scope and outside very quickly. I'm like, oh shit. But I'm able to discern that they're wearing some kind of a chest rack, carrying a rifle, got the, the Pakul hat, that they, these guys, they look like Taliban. At least they have the silhouette of a Taliban. Um, now the second person in the, in the patrol moves into my sights. And I know this is, may very well be my last opportunity to initiate the ambush. If I don't initiate the ambush, this enemy patrol is going to continue down the road and they're going to run into that other ranger, the one that we have on the radio at the mission support site. So I would be leaving my boy hanging, you know, basically signing his death warrant if I let these guys pass. At least that's how I, how, how, how I yeah. saw it. Uh, that second guy in the order of movement moves into my site. Same thing. He's got his chest rig. He's got his hat on. He's got the beard. Um, but I'm not able to discern specific details um, beyond that because they're in the shadows underneath these trees. And, and he has a gun in his right hand. He has some, a rifle in his right hand. Um, so I fire. It was not a good firing position, as I described, but I took the best shot that I could. I was firing actually through like some tree limbs that were hanging down. The, with the suppressor, it just sort of sounds like a little snap. 
the, the gun kind of vibrates uh, as a recoil vibrates in, uh, in my hands as I fire. And then everything is quiet for a second, like birds chirping kind of quiet for maybe two, three seconds. And then there comes the counterattack. And now the whole world is on fire. The, uh, all the Afghans start shooting. They are doing the squat, firing the Kalashnikov on full auto from the hip. And it's, and there's just like hot brass going in every direction. There's bullets going all over the place. The American who's with me, he's firing. Um, I, I try to get back on target to where I had seen the enemy. And I fire through maybe 15 more rounds. Um, you're not supposed to use a sniper rifle as a suppressive weapon, okay? But because I can't discern where they are, I'm firing at known likely and suspected targets, you know, near trees and things like this. Um, meanwhile, the enemy is firing back at us, and they're firing pretty effectively. I, there are bullets just kicking up dirt into my eyes, like a, fr a foot in front of my face. The tree that I'm taking cover behind is being turned into splinters. There's like literally splinters falling down on top of me from this tree as it gets chewed up by gunfire. Um, I found out later there's some grenades that went off somewhere behind me that I didn't even know about at the time. Um, and then what happens, the Afghans have these little walkie-talkies, like Motorola walkie-talkies. And one of them jumps up and it starts saying, I, I can't, it, it, he's saying something, like, no good, no good, something like this. And I really didn't know what the hell he was saying, except that like, stop, something's wrong. And through his, through his body language and everything else, I, I mean, we got the message and we called ceasefire and we got all the Afghans uh, to stop shooting. Everyone stopped shooting. Everything calmed down. And now it's just kind of like a panicked situation in the sense that this Afghan is like jumping up and down. He's on the radio talking in Pashto. Um, but me and Val, we, we have no idea what the hell's going on. And we're starting to wonder here, like, what the fuck is going on right now like who who just walked in who what is uh, did we just ambush a afghan police unit like is that what just happened here um so to someone has to sort out the confusion and uh believe it or not i'm the senior guy on this ambush so the one thing you never ever want to do at a, in an ambush is stand up because you get shot if you stand up on an ambush. That's, that's what dumbasses do. And I told Val, I was like, do not stand up. Do not stand up. You stay right where you are. And But no, nonetheless, someone has to go deconflict this whole thing. So I did what every dumbass has to do, and I stand up. And I, uh, I walk down the hill towards the road. And as I'm walking down, uh, I come face to face with my friend Paul, who is on the recce team. Paul was the assistant team leader and he has big brown beard and uh, come face to face. Paul looks at me. He's like, Murph. And I'm like, Paul, what the fuck are you oh. doing? And that was the moment. Like, we're like, Whoa, this is fucked. Like something is really wrong here. Um, I walked with Paul down, uh, down towards where the recce team was and the recce team leader was there with his shirt off. Um, and another recce team member um, applying uh, combat lifesaver, you know, techniques to him. Uh, he had been shot in the back and he was there with his shirt off and the, and the other guy was putting bandages on him. And this dude looks up at me, and says, who shot me? Who shot me? And I was like, I, I, don't, I don't fucking know. Because honestly, I did not fucking know. I really, there was a lot of chaos and I, I did not understand what the hell had just happened. Um, but now we're, we're, we're obviously it's, it's clear that the recce team had walked into our ambush and that's who we ambushed and had, a, we had a firefight with our own guys. It's, it's horrifying. Um, so the next thing that happens is we call in a medevac for the team leader and get him out of there. I thought this dude was going to die. I thought he had been shot between the shoulder blades and was about to die. It, it wasn't. What happened was he, um, the round, went across his shoulder blades, uh, like a grazing wound. It was a flesh wound, essentially. Um, so it was, it was non-lethal. Uh, it, it wasn't even, a, it wasn't a super serious injury. Um, thank God. But we got him out of there. We, we uh, put him on a Huey, got him out of there. That, that hasty landing zone we had reconned came in handy a lot sooner than we thought. Uh, got on the vehicles and we drove back to the BCP. And that was when 
me and Paul and all the other guys, we sat down and we did an AAR to figure out what had just happened. And so there's a lot of things that go into it, but um, long story short, I, I had freelanced setting up an ambush uh, I, that tactically I thought was the right decision um, to get the drop on the enemy. Uh, the recce team had gone out and done their recce mission and were on their way back. We did not know that. The last thing we were told was they were, they were warning us that there were some bad guys inbound on our position. We did not know because of the comms that the, uh, Val had that one radio um, and he was getting spotty comms on it. We did not know the recce team was on their way back. If, if we did know that, it would have changed some things, of course. Uh, another thing that played into it was that the recce team, it took them hours to get out there and recon the objective, but it only took them like 15 minutes to come back. So the way back was much faster. Again, we, we did not know that. And then you can also look at it. You know, I was the one who initiated the ambush and I'm responsible for it. Should I have positively identified the target and made absolutely 100% sure that I was shooting a Taliban and not an American? Um, I, in my mind, the beard, the hat, the ammunition, chest rig, the rifle, I had positively identified enemy combatants on the battlefield in my mind. Um, but I was wrong. I made the wrong call. Um, I, you know, I blame myself for what happened that day, but I also understand that I was a 21 year old sniper and I made the best decisions I could with the information I had. Um, but nonetheless, it, it was an, an embarrassing, humiliating uh, experience for me. And it was downright painful for that team leader, that guy who I hurt, um, caused embarrassment for the unit, um, for the sniper section, uh, and, and created a mess, you know? And that's something that you have to learn how to live with. How did you do it, Jack? How did you rebound from that? Because you clearly did. Like you went on to do a lot of su successful things. And I think in that deployment, you continue on, right? So yeah. what did you tell yourself, especially at that age, to get out of that? Well, you know, one of the things about Ranger Battalion that Rangers have that others do not have is, you know, the Ranger Creed. Um, the Ranger Creed says that you're never going to quit. Uh, that, that surrender is not a ranger word. It's just not what we do. Um, so that's part of it. Um, and I also understood on some level, if I threw in the towel here, it, this would define my entire life. Like this would be who I am. Like I'm a failure today. If I quit now, I'm going to be a failure for the rest of my life. That's who I'm going to be. And so I kept, I kept going. And it, it's what, it's what we do. It's what, I think it's what most Rangers would do. Um, and through, yeah, through that deployment, I continued to serve as a sniper. Um, they did a big investigation. Um, I, there were some safeguards put in place after that, but I continued to serve as a sniper throughout that deployment. And, uh, I I'm very grateful to Ranger battalion for giving me a second chance. Yeah. Um, that's a unit that does not give people second chances. It just doesn't happen. Um, and they did give me one. Um, and, I, and I got to serve the rest of that deployment as a sniper. And then I served my next deployment as a machine gun team leader um, in, a, in a line platoon. So I, I, had, I had a great, overall, I had a, a really great experience in Ranger Battalion. So as we kind of transition then like to your, your time in SF, there's one quote, I think it's from your time as a ranger that I just, I love this quote from the book. And I'm curious if you can just provide a little context here, but you say, um, so do you think riding outside a helicopter in flight during the night, under night vision and shooting guns from it sounds cool? Well, I won't lie to you, it fucking is. So I think anybody who's ever served would be like, God, I'd love to be on the side of a little bird flying around shooting. Were you taking shots with a, a sniper rifle off the side of a little bird? Yes. Um, not in combat. I did not kill anyone during a mission. It wasn't necessary. Um, but we, we trained that way. And that was that same deployment. And that was after my friendly fire incident. That I, I was still doing those kinds of operations. And what happened was uh, 160th flew in. They came in in little birds and supported some of our missions. And so we did a, a training run. Uh, you know, you sit out on the, the pods, the little skids on the outside of the aircraft, and you just sit on it and snap in with a snap link with a little lanyard 
um, just in case. And uh, you hold the SR25 in your lap. You, we have a, uh, at that time, it was what, a PQ4, uh, a PQ2, but infrared laser on your, on your rifle. And so you have your night vision down and you use the infrared sight and just put them on the targets and would fly out over the range and just and shoot from the hip, Jack. Shooting from the hip because you can't look down your sights. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then we went with the little birds and um, and we did uh, a couple combat operations. We did one. Um, I, I believe it was like a Taliban intelligence officer. But we went in there uh, on little birds. It was a hell of a crazy flight in the middle of the night um, in, in Afghanistan, where it's just uh, the the wind coming over you, pushing you off the side of the pod uh, <laughs> as you're racing through these mountains, uh, and then come over the objective area and just kind of like hovering back and forth. Um, so it was a, a half gaff mission. So we were the helicopter assault force, and then there's a ground assault force coming in and Humvees. And so it's timed perfectly. So we both get there at the same time. Um, as we got there, uh, there was uh, some people in the compound started coming out and milling about. I don't know if it was like six in the morning or whatever. Um, so the other little bird, there's two little birds out there. I was on one. My uh, team leader, Joe, was on the other. The other little bird pilot decides to swoop in on the compound to keep their heads down until the Charlie company guys get up there and breach the door. So I'm watching under nods. It's like this little bird just does like a nosedive. It just comes straight down inside inside this compound, inside the walls, and then pulls up and just like the rotor wash just kicks up dust all throughout the compound. And then the guy pulls up and flies back up into the air. And the pilots are absolutely amazing. And, uh, and, and it works. And then Charlie Company comes in and they do the Ranger thing and, you know, put boots to asses and hogtie everyone. Um, it was a good mission, and it was, it was the pilot who was flying the aircraft I was on. It was his last mission before he went to go uh, be a simulator instructor, so he was all stoked up about that, cheering over the radio. And um, I got to work with 160th a couple more times um, in training, and also uh, in, in, in let's see, yeah, in, in Iraq both times I was in Iraq. I got to fly with 160th, so I was incredibly fortunate. They're amazing. So. <laughs> God, that is awesome. All right. So let's jump to you in SF. And one of the things that you mentioned is having to like, I think it's when you're, maybe it's in the Q course or a little bit later, but you're having to get out of the Ranger mindset and into the SF mentality. And I'm sure that there are a lot of guys who have done the transition, but there aren't that many. I, I mean, like within the community, you probably know of them, but there aren't a ton of guys who have been Rangers and SF folks in the post 9-11 era. Like what is the mentality shift like you come off as more, I think of the SF type person, yeah. but I, I'm curious, like, what did that mean to you? You know, the, the, the Rangers and special forces have very different cultures um, because they have very different units. The Rangers are a direct action unit. That's what they do. They are like super soldiers uh, doing direct action raids. Special Forces is designed to be an unconventional warfare unit. So they're, they're not even really supposed to be like a commando unit per se. They're supposed to be instructors and trainers, and they will go out with indigenous soldiers and conduct operations or do what, whatever it is we need them to do. So it, it's sort of their, their mission is to work by, with, and through partner forces. And even today, Special Forces, the way they advertise themselves as being the nation's premier partner force. Rangers advertise themselves as being the premier raid force. So the Rangers are very regimented. They're deal they have young privates in there. They, you, I mean, the discipline has to be harsh. Um, you know, this is literally something I have heard in Ranger Battalion. There is the wrong way, or no, there is the Ranger way, and there is the wrong way. <laughs> Full stop. That's it. It's a very black and white world. This is the way it is done. You do not deviate. You do exactly what you're told. Uh, you have your fresh haircut, God damn it. Uh, there's no, no bullshit. Um, in special forces, it's not like that at all. Um, there, especially when you're deployed and you're, you're overseas, there isn't time to micromanage you. Everyone on that team has to do their job and just do it on their own without being told. You know, you are only a, a, a special forces team is just 12 guys at best. You may be partnered with an indigenous force of 
50 guys, of 100 guys, whatever it is, every guy on that ODA has to do their fucking job. And they just have to do it without being told. So you're expected to think outside the box. You're expected to make decisions. I mean, my team sergeant was never like, Jack, how much ammunition did you expend on this training uh, that you did with the Iraqis? I I don't think he even asked to ever look at my training schedule with the Iraqis, really. I mean, it was just something he expected me to do. And when he did spot check it, I I would like to think he was satisfied with what he saw and that we were were working and doing our job. Um, So he didn't have to um, engage in that kind of handholding. But going from one unit to the other, it involves like a, a massive cultural shift and a change in mindset. And um, there, there are all sorts of examples, but especially working with indigenous soldiers, and I made this mistake too, when I worked with the Iraqi SWAT team is my initial impression, my initial idea was that I need to train these guys to be like Rangers. All right, this is an Iraqi SWAT team. So I want them to be the best Iraqi SWAT team this country has ever seen and will ever see. And these guys need to be trained to standard, like ranger standards. They need to be able to do all of that. And no, the, the reality is no, they do not need to do, know or be able to do all of that. They, we need to train them and, and we need to train them well. And there's some things they need to be proficient on. But trying to recreate a mirror image of American military units is the wrong approach because this is not an American military unit. And they're never going to be able to function like an American military unit. Um, And you have to keep in mind also, the American military, our doctrine is designed to work in a joint environment. So like when I was a ranger, I could call you guys, we could call up Apaches to come in and support our operations. Um, And our doctrine is built around that. Um, in, In a foreign country, you're training Iraqis, they can't call up Apaches. Like it, it, the, the, and the units over there, they hate each other so much. They probably can't even call up another police unit to come up. So trying to tr- create a mirror image of ourselves is, is the wrong approach when working with I- I indigenous soldiers. So I had to completely change my mentality um, going from one unit to the other. Man. And then you go, you, you go on to the weapons sergeant course, right? And you're, that's kind of your assigned role in the unit. Um, t- Take us through one of your um, combat experiences there in an SF unit. Now that we've heard kind of what it looks like on the Ranger side, what did an SF deployment feel like? Um, Different in some ways, very different, but also somewhat the same. I mean, we were working off of a base. Um, This was Fob Salerno um, near, uh, I'm sorry, geez, uh, Salerno was in Afghanistan. This is um, uh, Sykes, Fob Sykes. Uh, outside Tel Afar or Tel Afar. Um, and, uh, you know, we get, we get there, we inherited a, uh, a SWAT team, an Iraqi SWAT team that another, um, that other ODAs had stood up and worked with over previous rotations. So we were quite fortunate in that regard that we, we picked them up. Um, and then me and my junior Bravo and our senior Echo actually as well, um, all worked on training them and trying to make them more proficient. Um, and so as far as the deployment, what it looked like, this was 2009. Um, we all knew what we were winding down. So the mission, as it was explained to me, was that we need to get these guys proficient and able to stand on their two feet so that the United States can withdraw from Iraq. So, okay, there's my, there's my job. So I'm trying to get things, uh, ironed out. Um, we're we're both trying to train these guys. But also, we're having to inject ourselves as Americans into the administrative side of how the Iraqi police force works or does not work. Um, Like simple things like getting these guys paid. Like everything is a total nut roll over there. Um, The the bureaucracy, the infighting, the the who has the clout, who can do this, who can do... um, it, It was almost impossible to get the Iraqi bureaucracy to function. And so... We, we did try to make those inroads and like, hey, partner force A, why don't you talk to partner force B? Hey, you guys are both Iraqis. Why don't you shake hands here and start working together to protect your country, huh? They just would not do it. Um, so I would have a training schedule. We trained the Iraqis five days a week um, on everything from CQB to driving, 
um, do physical training, especially when they pissed me off, they do physical training with us. Uh, <laughs> set up uh, stress shooting with them. Um, I, I ran a whole counter sniper curriculum for them. That was like a week long. Um, we do all sorts of different stuff. We did some map reading. Um, one interesting thing we did was we got the Iraqi Air Force. They had a couple of Hueys fly in. And so we, we did uh, training and operations. Again, here's the Iraqi ground force. We are introducing you to the Iraqi Air Force. Work together, guys. And they did. Uh, it, it, we did a couple missions with them that came out pretty well. Um, and then what happened was because of the dicey political situation in Iraq at the time, um, well, we were doing operations. We did some high value target strikes. I can talk about a few of them if you want. Um, sure. And as time went on, that escalated because the other um, American forces and their partner forces, um, like the Delta Force dudes and the, uh, the other ODA, who's a dive team um, from our company, we knew those guys, they were in Mosul. And they would keep getting shut down for political reasons because the Iraqi government doesn't like it that you're busting up their mafia pals. So they'll <laughs> shut down the military. They're like, you're shut down. No more operations. They get out the Thalaka stick and you get the wag of the finger. Um, so, those are the, so all the high speed cool guys kept getting shut down. So what happened was those mission sets got pushed to the guys who are not shut down. And that was us, the Telefar SWAT team and their ODA partner force. So suddenly we're getting all these cool missions and we're getting the cool helicopters. So 160th is flying for us. Um, so we're getting to do all this cool stuff that we, we weren't getting to do before. Um, so as far as like what that looks like on the ground, yeah. um, <laughs> it, I was the trainer. I was the, as a senior Bravo, I was the, you know, the, the senior tactical advisor. Um, we would plan out the operation. Um, and, uh, on some level, we would bring the Iraqis into it to help the planning process and, and, and let them be a part of it. Um, the logistics, you know, especially if there's helicopters involved, okay, the Americans are planning that. They, we're not going to leave that in their hands. Um, we'd plan out the whole operation and how it was going to go, figure out our, our ingress routes and egress and, and contingency routes and everything else. Um, how we're going to isolate the target, where the vehicles are going to park, and, and so on and so forth. And then there would be different Americans assigned to different um, Iraqi, you know, call them squads, call them assault teams, whatever you want. Essentially, it would be a platoon's worth of Iraqis. So I might be with one element. Our senior Charlie Mike would be with another element. Our senior Delta, our senior medic Jerry, he might be with another element. And um, so we would each be supervising, you know, 10 Iraqis, something like that. And we did not do a whole lot of explosive breaching like we did in Ranger Battalion, where we're doing more mechanical breaches or, or uh, sometimes knocking on the door and, and just uh, seeing who answers. But we did mechanical breaching mostly. I don't really recall doing explosive breaching with those guys at that time. I think that was one of those things that was like verboten. Um, so we would co come in on Humvees or we'd come in on helicopters if we were lucky enough to fly with 160th or, or with the Iraqi Air Force in a couple instances. And, um, you know, isolate the target area. We would make, uh, make the breach, enter and clear rooms. Uh, the Iraqis could be quite proficient on CQB as long as you were putting a boot up their ass. It was like the second they weren't supervised, like things would just come apart. It was like, oh my God, what are you doing right now? Um, and you'd have to go and yell at them and get them back in line. Um, Jack, real quick. So like, it, I, I imagine like when you're clearing a room as a ranger or just a conventional unit, it's scary enough as it is. Now you're kind of responsible for directing this indigenous force to clear a room. Is it more nerve wracking for you going in there or is the target set different so it's not as dangerous? It, it was pretty dangerous in some cases more dangerous than probably my mind comprehended um i i wasn't i, I wouldn't say it was so nerve-wracking for me per se uh, uh, only because like in the heat of the moment you're not really thinking about uh about how how scary this should be you're more just focused on doing your job uh so i i mean it, it, a lot of it, it it became directing traffic so it was not my job, and this sounds kind of like Machiavellian um, to some people maybe, but it's not It's not my job to be the first guy through the breach point anymore. 
It, now it's my job for the or to enable the Iraqis to fight for their country. So it would typically be Iraqis going through the door first. Um, there were instances where I went through the door first. I was not at all afraid to jump into the stack with those guys, and and I would. Um, but sometimes, yeah, it, it does get kind of dicey, left unsupervised. Like I, I remember one time where I was the first guy. I just happened to be the first guy in in the um, coming up through a hallway. And I told the Iraqis, all right, stack on me. Let's go. We're doing this. And I go in and I clear the room. I take my corner. And, you know, when you clear the room, you clear your corner and then you're sweeping your rifle barrel until you come just a couple feet off of the rifle barrel of the number two man through the door who's going to the opposite corner. So I'm clearing and clearing and clearing and clearing. And there's no other rifle barrel. And I'm like, so I clear all the way to the other corner of the room. I'm like, holy fuck, I'm in here by myself. And all the other guys, they, they just blew right through past the door. I mean, maybe they were trying to get uh, their, their advisor, Jack, killed. They had had enough of me. I don't know. Uh, but they just let me go through that door by myself, and they shot down the hall and went somewhere else. And I was like, oh, my fucking God, you guys. Uh, <laughs> so they, they, were, they were very good in some regards, but um, a lot of them, they, they just needed a lot of supervision, um, at least the the – the, the NCOs were pretty good, but the junior guys or the, the sometimes some take cases they weren't junior at all. Um, the but the the privates, I guess, in the unit, they they just needed a lot of supervision. Like they needed gotcha. full supervision all the time. Man, all right. So like I could sit, I could sit here for hours. I don't want to take your whole day. Um, I I want to touch on some of the investigative journalist work you did. Mm -hmm. Um, and I guess. What was the decision to go do that? I, I, I guess that's one of the things I want to know. Like this life there's definitely the adrenaline that you describe and the places you go but what was the kind of origin story for that it was sort of accidental i mean i had my whole transition story coming out of the military and some people think i did a really good job at it i would beg to differ in some ways um i i was kind of running myself into the ground after i got out but i one of the many, many things I was trying to, I did do when I got out of the military um, was uh, I co-founded a, a company that was like a news company. And it, it focused on military and special ops news. But I knew that in order for it to be relevant, it couldn't just be me telling war stories from back in the day. Like that's cool for a couple articles. Okay. I got, I got a couple war stories. Everyone does. And uh but you cannot run a, a, a news website just telling stories. Well, let me tell you about Iraq back in 2005. We need to go out into the field and actually see what's going on out there and, and break news and, and, and report what's going on. So that was kind of the genesis of it. And I mean, no one else is going to do it for me. So I had to go and do it myself. Um, so the first thing I did was I used some contacts I'd made in, in Europe. And I went and I did a training exercise with the Swiss military. Um, so this, this one is not so dangerous. It's fairly, fairly uh, friendly and, and uh, fun. But I went over there and I wore, you know, uh, I wore a camo and I, I carried a Swiss military rifle, a SIG 550, and did this infantry training exercise with them for like a three day weekend. Um, and, I, and I wrote a story about it. And, and I mean, when was the last time you read an article written about some reporter out there training with a the Swiss military? So yep. it was so that, that was, that was kind of like me dipping my feet into it. That was a trial run. And uh, then the real baptiz baptism by fire came uh, when the Syrian civil war kicked off and ISIS came to town. And that was a, it was a real heartbreaking moment for me and so many other veterans that all of the work we did was essentially for nothing. And the people in the towns that we had fought to protect were, you know, in, in some cases, literally annihilated uh, you know, people murdered, everyone murdered, all the children and women sold into slavery. I mean, it's as bad as it gets. Um, so, and I was, I was unfortunately watching it from afar and I was talking to some of the Iraqi SWAT team guys I knew and some of the interpreters I knew and hearing about what was going on back there. And then an opportunity came up, somebody, a contact I knew had gone and joined up with the Kurds and he had been in, uh, you know, northeastern Syria, uh, area that the Kurds call Rojava. Uh, and he apparently had a way that I could get smuggled into the country and report on the ground in a war zone. 
And I took that opportunity and went with it. And it was, this was very early on in the war, it was 2014. And there had been very, very few, there were no Americans. Well, other than, uh, than there were a few international volunteers yeah. in Java at the time. There's no American military. I don't care what rumors people say, there's no CIA there. There were no CIA dudes calling in airstrikes like some people would whisper. That was not happening at that time. Um, there was maybe one other reporter from CNN had been to Rojava at that point. But I mean, I, I was one of the first journos to kind of get into that area um, and report. And yes, it, it was an odyssey, suffice to say. So I, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead here, but one of the things that you say that I just need the context around where you're with the YPJ, I think, and you mentioned this like eerie feeling of death kind of lurking around the corner. You'd never felt that anywhere before or since, which after the, the descriptions you've just given of your time in uniform and some of the ones that we didn't even touch on, like you're in a truck rolling over, like you've got nine lives, but this is the point in time where you're like, this is a bad feeling in this area. What, what the hell made it that bad for you? Yeah, it's something that's hard to describe. It's a feeling that lingers in the air. And I, you know, I've been to Iraq and Afghanistan in, and I've been, I've been to other places around the world too, not necessarily war zones, but I mean, I've been around a little bit and I'd never experienced that sensation before that you feel in that part of Syria. And I hope it doesn't feel like that anymore, but it just has this feel of pending death. It's like what I imagine it feels like if you go and visit like the Auschwitz museum, like you can just like, they're, they're like, there's something just hanging there in the air. Whereas Iraq and Afghanistan, they were war zones. There's the potential for violence around a corner. You know, it could happen um, at any time. In Rojava, it was just a pervasive feeling everywhere you went that this was a place where something bad had happened. God. All right. So I know you, you meet Assad, which is the craziest story. Um, I can't imagine what's going through your mind there. You're, you're detained at one point by uh, local intel services. You've also broken stories that like help service member families who are dealing with potential cover-ups, basically. So I think without taking all of your time here, wh what are you most proud of as you look back on this? What, what, what are some of those things that come to mind where you're like, that's why I did this? And I, well... I mean, I, I'm quite proud of my military service as, as jaded as I am about it and, and, you know, even bitter and angry. I mean, I've come to terms with some of those things over the years, but I, I am quite proud to have been a Ranger and have been a Green Beret. And, and I love the military for all of the things that are lovable about it. You know, it's a, it a great experience in so many ways. Um, but there are things that I don't like about the military. Um, there, there are cultural things I don't like about the military. There are people in the military that I don't care for. I don't think they're good people. Um, and journalistically, it, it's very difficult for me to put my finger on and say, does, does any of it matter? I guess the same as my military career. I look at it. Does any of it matter? Does any of it make an impact? And it's very hard to say. And, and the, the, the real answer is, I don't know. There are some people who really appreciate the work that I've done. Um, sometimes they're family members, sometimes they're spouses, sometimes they're soldiers, who appreciate that, you know, I was willing to shed light on something and say something that other people weren't. Um, there are other people out there who would like to have me assassinated if they had a chance. Um, they would bury me in a shallow grave in a heartbeat um, because they think I'm such a bastard. And, and maybe I am a bastard. Maybe I'm a real son of a bitch that I go prying on things uh, and, and overturning rocks that some people think shouldn't be overturned. Um, but I don't do it simply to be contrarian or simply to hurt people. Um, I do it because I think we should be better as a country. Um, and I, I think that when you're dealing with, uh, if the military is trying to cover something up, if they're lying about something, if they're lying about our soldiers and how they fought and how they died, that's wrong. Uh, I think that if you're trying to cover up a murder or a sexual assault, that that's wrong. And that people who do that shouldn't, they have no place in our military and they shouldn't be there. They shouldn't have a, our flag on their shoulder. Um, people who commit war crimes are a disgrace to our country. They should not have an American flag on their shoulder. Um, so that's, that's why I do what I do. And, 
and why I think it's important. Um, and there are, there are certainly different stories I've worked on over the years that deal with all of these things. And I mean, I, I can talk about any of them if, if you're interested. I, I loved all of them. I'm more concerned about your time. I mean, the sexual assault case that you, or cases, but there are some in particular that you broke that just are heartbreaking to yeah. hear from somebody like, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm jaded, but you know, I definitely look back on some of the things you said and I'm like, God, it did suck in those cases, but I still have like infinity for the military, but hearing that is just heartbreaking. We, we were also the lucky ones. That's why we still have that good feeling about the military and why we had a good experience. Yeah. We, we serve, like in my case, when I look back on now, now I can see it. Now that I'm a 37 year old man, I've seen the real, really the dark side of the military working as a journalist. When I look back at my own experiences, I can readily recognize my leaders as ethical, good leaders, that they were good people. Even the ones, even the ones I really didn't like, <laughs> the ones that I, I just did not like them. I did not like their personality. I can look back at all of them and recognize that they were good men and that they were good soldiers and that I was lucky to serve with them. Um, and that's why I, I, I think I'm probably so pro-military to this day and why I love the military. There are other people out there who do not have that same view of the military. And I, I can't hold it against them because of what they experienced. They went through the trauma of being uh, assaulted sexually assaulted, and then the institution that they loved and supported just as much as I did, betrayed them. And I, I can only imagine what that what that does to a person. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess with that in mind, without getting into a specific story, but just you, you kind of described this journey of having to come to grips with people hating you. Yeah. And, and eventually, it seems like you've gotten to a point where you're just going to do it. Yeah. What what was like the nail in the coffin for you? You're like, I just don't give a damn anymore. And I'm going to do this. I mean, I'm, I understand where the anger comes from in so many cases. Um, because again, I go, I go prying and I, I go overturning rocks and I, I expose things and I, I get it. I, I get it on some level, but I, I think there's also a larger picture um, and I'm sorry if I'm struggling to articulate it in a, a little bit, but what I realized is that I cannot be an investigative journalist covering the military while simultaneously being a veteran of these units in good standing with these units. Um, the, the, the two things just contradict each other. If, if I am trying to, like, I just want to be loved by special forces or by ranger battalion, then I need to do something very different with my life. You know, I need to, I need to be that person. Um, and, and there are other people who can be that person for them and, and they can play that role and they, and everything they do can be positive about the military. And I think that's great. I'm not that person. And I can't be that person. If they want me to be leading the cheerleader uh, parade for army special ops, I can't be that person every day. Sometimes I'm the person that has to tell you some things you don't want to hear. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I understand it. And I, and I also see lots of hypocrisy. Um, you know, there's a lot of like, shoot the messenger. It's like, yep. hey, get, you know, fuck Jack Murphy. It's like, wow, you read that entire article and that was your takeaway was fuck Jack Murphy. Like, what about the guy that uh, raped that girl? What do you think about that? Yeah. Uh, the story I just wrote, what do you, what do you think about the, uh, this uh, JSOC guy who, it, from the evidence, it looks like he shot and killed Somebody, I don't want to say in cold blood, but it, it could potentially be a murder. I mean, how do you feel about that? And so I think the, uh, like, yeah, the fuck Jack Murphy. I mean, that, that's like, that's just a given. We already know that. Now, now, now what comes next? Got it. You know, what comes after that? So no, I, 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 I'm really not bothered um, by people hating me. And, and I see that as part of the grieving process that they're going through and that they have to go through. Um, yeah. Anger. Um, it, it's misdirected. It's anger they have at the military and they're directing it at me. And it's going to take them some time to get there and to realize, and maybe they never will. I mean, some people just sink into that delusion, um, but it's going to take them a little bit of time to come to terms. Uh, you know, the military and the, the unit that they love is not always what they think it is. When, when you were in uh, combat and as a journalist, was there anything you carried with you as like a 
good luck charm or something out of superstition that you just needed to have with you on every mission? No, not really. I mean, I guess I have certain pieces of equipment that are near and dear to my heart. Um, my Arcteryx uh, rucksack I've had all over the world. I love that thing. There, there is a, a there's a cool T-shirt, uh, like a button-up shirt that I used to wear. I wore I wore it in Afghanistan, my first deployment, and I've worn it all over the world. And I finally destroyed it a couple of years backpacking in Nepal, so I had to get rid of it. Uh, there, there are a few little things. I wouldn't say I, I never had any sort of a talisman or anything I would carry around, though. Yeah. All right. So let, last thing here, and uh, this is a question I try to ask everyone, and in particular, I'm really interested to hear your answer. Um, you, you talk about kind of maybe being a little bit jaded. And in the book, you describe like, as you've grown older, um, you've fallen from the special faith that exists between a soldier and the army, I no longer believe. But then you also talk about, you know, spending your youth fighting and dying alongside other young men in combat, much more powerful experience than some of those who were just in college and didn't see that. And I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. I wonder, as you look back on those experiences, especially what you've done since, would you go back as that 18 year old and do it again? I mean, it, it's, it's hard. I mean, like, are you talking about like as a 37 year old and an 18 year old's body, would I go back and do it again? Probably, I, probably not the same way. I mean, if I were to go back, probably or if I had to, I'd probably go back, try to be like an Intel guy or something like that. I'm getting a little long in the tooth for, uh, for all that infantry stuff. I mean, as much as I, I liked it, I mean, I guess I could, I'm not, I'm not totally geriatric yet. I could probably still do it, but um, I mean, I don't regret it. I don't, re I don't regret joining the military at all. Um, I had a great experience. Um, and I also don't regret getting out. I think I got out at the right time for me. I had did what I was going to do. Um, had I stayed in the military longer, I think I would have just become like that bitter senior NCO with, you know, a cup of coffee in one hand and a cigarette in the other, walking around, yelling at, yelling at the younger guys. Um, so I, I think I got out at the right time. Um, so, but, and, you know, I encourage people to join the military when they, they come to me and they say, Hey, I saw, uh, I read your book or I saw a podcast you did or something like that. And I, I, uh, I want to join the military and I, I always encourage them and try to give them some encouragement. Um, and, you know, but also they need to know that this is some real shit. And that's why I put some of those stories in my book and told them the real deal. Um, I had one person come to me, uh, Justin Lassick, hit me up on, on like Twitter. It was like, hey, Jack, you know, like I, I, I saw some of the stuff you did back in the day and it, and it was partly what inspired me to join the military. And I'm like, wow, man, that's so cool, Justin. And, and he became a Green Beret. And I was like, that's, that's so cool, man. And then the next thing he tells me, I lost my legs and my balls in Afghanistan. Oh. I'm like, holy shit, dude. And uh, he's a really good guy. We, I did like a long interview with him recently. Um, but like this shit is for real. I mean, that could happen. Um, and, you know, Justin, I think he's going to be okay, but it, it's not easy to come away from that. Yeah. God. And then I guess just as we wrap up here, you've got several novels. You've written your, your uh, Murphy's Law, which is just such a great, a great title for, for what you describe. Um, You've got your show, right? Uh, Team House. Like, what else is going on for you now? What's what's coming up uh, around the corner for you and and your next endeavors? Yeah, I mean, I don't think I'll ever be able to stop writing. Um, yeah, I've written four like military fiction novels uh, about mercenaries and modern warfare, uh, and I, I have a fifth one I got to finish. And then, yeah, my memoir Murphy's Law came out a few years ago which uh, I was really pleased to see, you know, the, the reception to that. And it actually got a really nice review in a Special Forces Association magazine um, just recently by so, some of my heroes. So those guys that I talked to earlier in the show, um, the Vietnam guys who served as warp rangers and in Special Forces, guys like Ken Miller and Jim Morris, uh, John Stryker Mayer, those guys were my heroes. To have them review my work, and to invite me to the association to talk about it and, and then put it into their magazine has been, that, that's the best review uh, that I could ever possibly have gotten um, from the book. And it just means the world to me. Um, so other than that, I mean, I write for connectingvets.com. Um, that's where most of my work appears 
Um, there was a, 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 an article I wrote fairly recently you can find on Yahoo. It's about a CIA covert operation uh, where four guys were lost at sea um, during this mission back in 2008. Um, that's on Yahoo. And um, what else? And, th and then, yeah, I do a live stream, uh, live stream and podcast every week. It's Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern time with my, my co-host is usually here sitting next to me, Dave Park, who's a former ranger. And we interview people from the special forces world, um, special operations, uh, people from the intelligence community, from the CIA. So, so a dude like you would be perfect um, to get on there someday. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for the time, Jack. I really appreciate it and all the work you're doing. The book is great. I, I can't recommend it enough. The stories, and I should say, like I'm sitting here at night on my Kindle reading it. I'm laughing my ass off at some of these stories. And my wife's like, what, what are you laughing about? I'm like, it's too hard to explain. Like you can't understand it unless you've been in and seen this stuff on a fob or in a training scenario. So it, it's really well done. I appreciate the time, man. I'm, I'm glad it resonated with you, man. Uh, and that's, you know, I, I really hope that it's uh, edifying for the public and, and maybe teaches them or educates them about what was going on over there. And, and for the, you know, fellow veterans out there, I hope that it resonates uh, and reminds them of their own deployment stories. <laughs> for sure. Well, ha have a good one, Jack. Take care, man. Yeah, thanks so much. I hope you enjoyed this combat story. If you want to tell your own story, go to combatstory.com. If you know someone we should interview, send me their info at ryan at combatstory.com. Hearing these stories can be tough or bring back your own memories. If you're battling PTSD, please call the Veteran Crisis Line at 1-800-273-8255. 273-8255. Stay safe.